Welcome to Morningstar Christian Chapel YouTube channel. Please remember to hit that subscribe button, like button, and the notification bell so you can find out when we go live or post a new video. And be sure to leave a comment about what God has shown you in this message. Thanks, and enjoy the study. Turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. Tonight, Luke chapter 21. We're going to take a deep dive into three verses at the end of Luke 21. We're going to cover verses 34 through 36. Uh, when you get there, we'll read it and, um, and we'll pray and then we'll get into the message. I believe as we go through just the reading of it, that it'll become very apparent to our own hearts why we're here this evening. Luke 21, verse 34, uh, Jesus says this, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Father, we pray that you glorify yourself through the teaching of your word here tonight. Lord, that our hearts would be open to receive the instruction that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The title of this evening's message is Christian Conduct in Critical Days. Even within the last 24 hours, it goes without saying that the Lord has called us to live for Him in the most crucial of days. And in light of what's taking place in the world around us, I believe the Lord has directed my heart to this very text for this very reason. Uh, even just yesterday, Iran launched almost 200 ballistic, ballistic missiles into Israel. And we're sitting back and we're watching that and we're realizing we are living in biblical times. Now, as we go through this text, what I hope, uh, your heart, what I hope is illuminated to your heart is that the Christian doesn't have anything to fear in light of these things. Uh, we're prepared for this, or we should be prepared for this. We should be watching the news with our Bible in hand and be able to say, Lord, you said this would come to pass. So you look at what's taking place in Israel. Israel is uh, the Lord's prophetic time clock. Keep your eye on Israel. Um, in these coming days, we see this, this war between Russia and the Ukraine. It's continuing to rage on. And even in our own nation, we're watching the devastating effects of the hurricanes in these uh, southern states. And our nation is currently navigating through the most uncertain time politically and socially in the history in our own history as a nation. Unprecedented time. So, what should the Christian's response be in days like these? How should we be viewing? How should we be living in light of the eminency of the return of Christ? I'm gonna say that a few times in the message tonight. When you hear me say the eminency of Christ's return, the word eminency just, remain, just, may, just uh, means, excuse me, that the Lord can come back at any second. Uh, nothing needs to take place in the prophetic calendar for the Lord to return uh, even now. In our text, Jesus tells us what the attitude of the Christian should be in the le last days. So before we jump into this, let me take a moment to kind of set the context. We're in the final days of the life of Christ prior to his crucifixion. Uh, these words were spoken during the last week on Sunday was a triumphant entry. Jesus rode into Jerusalem as it was prophesied of him in Daniel, that he would ride into Jerusalem on, uh, on a colt. They all, shout out, they all shouted out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Remember on Monday, he goes into the, the temple and he cleanses the temple. On that Tuesday, the longest day recorded in the, in the life of Jesus, you see him teaching in the temple and debating the religious leaders. And what's been, always been amazing to me about this last week of the life of Christ is that he moves forward with the reality of the cross in his heart and his mind. When we go through suffering, when suffering is, is before us, we, we tend to shy away 
from meeting the needs of others. And with uh, the heart of Jesus being full of the cross, the reality of his suffering in front of him, he continues to press on. And because Jesus was faithful to move forward in the midst of opposition, in the reality of suffering in a few days, because he was faithful to do that, we have these uh, prophetic teachings that are found in Luke 21. We are somewhere in our text between Wednesday and Thursday. On Friday, we know that he'd be crucified. In our text, Jesus is on the Mount of Olives, and he's responding to his disciples' question about the signs of the times and the end of the age. Look at verse 7 in Luke 21 with me. It says, So they asked him, saying, Teacher, but when will these things be, and what will be the sign there will be when these things are about to take place. And he goes on to warn them about the reality of deception. He goes on to warn them about the reality of persecution and pestilences and famines and fearful sights and great signs. He talks about the the destruction of Jerusalem. And what I want to do to kind of give us a running start before we get into verse 34 is I want to read from verses 25 through 33. Jesus says this, he says, and there will be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and on the earth. Notice distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Notice this in verse 26, men's hearts failing them from fear in the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Now when when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Then he spoke to them the parable. Them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. And look at verse 33. It says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So the Lord is speaking to his disciples, those who would become the apostles. Think about who is in this setting. Judas is in this setting. He's speaking as a father to his children. He's speaking as the bridegroom to the bride of Christ. He's speaking to you and I. And in the reality of of his coming, in reality of the the rapture of the church and the wrath of God that's going to be poured out upon a Christ-rejecting world and, and his second coming, these are the instructions that he gives you and I on how we are to live in these three short verses. In verse 34, Jesus is going to issue a warning to us. In verse 35, Jesus is going to tell us why he is warning us. And in verse 36, Jesus is going to tell us how we should respond to this warning. Let's look at the the warning that the Lord gives us in verse 34. Again, I'm going to take time to develop these few verses where we're only going to be in 34 through 36 tonight. Jesus says, but take heed to yourselves. This word take heed is an interesting word. It means to to beware, to give attention to, and in the language, it is a present active imperative. Um, In other words, that just means that you must be constantly doing this. It's in the present tense, meaning you need to be doing it now. It's in the active, meaning you need to continue to do it. And it's an imperative, which means it's a command. He's not giving us an option. You must constantly and continually, as believers in a fallen world, be taking heed to, notice what he says, to yourselves. Not to your spouse on the right hand or the left of you. Not to your neighbor. And we live in such a comparative culture. And even in the midst of this comparative culture, the Lord doesn't want us to be overly consumed with the lives of others. He doesn't want us to be self-consumed, but he does want us to be self-aware. 
He doesn't want us to be so focused on, on what's going on in the world around us to the detriment of our own spiritual health and well-being. Because that temptation is there. I mean, you look what's taking place uh, politically and socially, and, and the believer, as you look at these things, and the crazier and crazier it gets, uh, the more challenging it gets for the, the, the believer or even the normal thinking person to reconcile all these things. Uh, but what the Lord tells us is to be, not be so consumed by this world because the world is going the way in which the Lord said it would go. You must take heed to yourselves. I love this quote by Charles Spurgeon. He said, beware of no man more than yourself. We carry our worst enemies within us. And that's so true. D.L. Moody, the, the great American evangelist, said, I have more trouble with D.L. Moody than with any man I have ever met. <laughs> we need to keep that perspective in our hearts and our minds that we need to take heed to ourselves with a correct perspective of the one who's calling us to do this. The one who loves us, the one who's called us, the one who desires to aid us in this process of sanctification and becoming more like Christ. As you take heed to yourself, put simply, you walk closer to the heart of Jesus and you have a deeper abiding relationship with him. So take heed to yourselves continually. On five other occasions throughout the Gospel of Luke, Jesus gives us the exhortation to take heed to ourselves. In other words, he tells us how to take heed to ourselves. And in Luke chapter 8, in verse 18, Jesus exhorts us to take heed to how we hear. Even tonight, as the word of God is going forth, there's an exhortation that rises from uh, the pages of Scripture to, the heart, to our hearts here tonight and tells us that we should take heed how we hear. Jesus says in Luke 18, excuse me, Luke 8, 18, he says, Therefore, take heed how you hear. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken away. Secondly, in Luke 11, verses 34 through 35, Jesus exhorts us to take heed to what we see. So notice what the Lord does. He says to take heed what we hear and take heed to what we allow our eyes to behold. Luke 11, 34 through 35 says this, The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body also is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body is also full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light. And when the bright shining of the lamp, it will give you light. Take heed how you hear. Take heed what you see. Christian, you must guard your ears in the days that you're living in. You must guard your eyes in the, in the world that we are navigating in. You want to take heed to yourself effectively, to take, take heed how you hear, take heed what you see. Jesus exhorts us thirdly to take heed and to beware of covetousness. In Luke 12, 15, he says, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. The amazing exhortation about, uh, against covetousness and taking heed to ourselves against covetousness is because the New Testament gives us further insight to what covetousness actually is. The Bible says that covetousness is idolatry. And the Bible tells us that no idolater will inherit the kingdom of heaven. John, at the end of 1 John, he, he exhorts the church. He says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. What is covetousness? It's desiring something that God doesn't desire for you to have, at least right now. And why, is, why does the Lord exhort us against this? Because it weighs the heart down. It distracts us. He tells us to take heed, to beware of covetousness. Fourthly, Jesus warns us about the importance of forgiveness. In Luke 17, he says, take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, 
you shall forgive him. So how do you take heed to yourself? Don't be content to live a life of unforgiveness. Nothing is going to drown out your hope. Nothing is going to drown out your Christian influence. Furthermore, on the authority of the words of Jesus, nothing is going to hinder your prayer life more than unforgiveness. And we have to allow these things to search our hearts. I don't know about you, but yesterday when I'm watching what's going on in Israel, I I sought some time alone with the Lord and I said, Lord, search me. Search my heart. Show me. Show me if there's any wicked way within me, anything in my life that is not pleasing to you, any unforgiveness in my heart, any covetousness in my heart, anything I'm allowing my eyes to see or my ears to hear, Lord, I want to be right because I know you're coming. The Lord in this chapter, in verse 8 of chapter 21, he tells us to take heed of the danger of deception. Look at what he says in verse 8. He says, take heed that no one deceive you. We are living and conducting our Christian lives in days of great deception. The Bible tells us that one of the signs of the last times will be a great falling away, a great apostasy. Those who have walked with the Lord and renounced their faith. We live in the days of great deception. If we are not taking heed to ourselves, we are all liable to be deceived. Why? Because the Bible tells us that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. The own, our own worst traitor lives within us. So the Lord exhorts us to take heed continually. You must continually do this constantly. Take heed to yourselves. When you begin begin to be diligent in your relationship with the Lord and begin to take heed to yourself diligently, you develop a passion for holiness. And I'll say this, just because culture has changed and the world has changed doesn't mean that God's standard has changed. God's standard is still holiness. The Lord says, be holy, for I am holy. In the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, When we give our lives to Christ positionally, we are sanctified and set apart. We are justified. We are holy. Philippians tells us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, not to work for it, but to work out what has been worked in, to live lives of holiness, because we need to conduct our lives that are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And nothing grieves the Holy Spirit and his working in our lives more than unholy, compromised living. So we need to take heed to ourselves. But Jesus tells us why we need to take heed to ourselves as he continues in verse 34. Look at the text with me. He says, Lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. It's important to note that, especially in the New Testament, when the Bible is speaking of your heart, he's not speaking or referring to your physical heart. This is referring to the deepest part of your spiritual being. It's the center of, and the seat of all of your your, uh, spiritual life. The word literally means the soul or mind, as it is the fountain and the seat of thoughts and passions and desires and appetites and affections and purposes. Your inner being, your inner man. This is why he warns us. We must take heed to ourselves, notice what he says in the text, lest our hearts be weighed down. The condition of your heart is of the utmost importance to the Lord. That's why the Lord tells us to keep our heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. We, we talked on Sunday about how, how the Bible tells us that hell and destruction are before the eyes of the Lord. How much more the hearts of the sons of man. So the Lord is greatly concerned with the condition of your heart. Why? Because everything in your life and mine proceeds from our hearts. And the Lord desires us to have a heart that is rightly related to him, not a heart that is weighed down. The word weighed down means to be overcharged. It literally means to be dulled or to be burdened down. As a Christian today, you don't want your heart to be dulled. You want your heart to be on fire for the Lord and ready to receive what he has to say to you with a willingness to obey the command 
that he gives you. This is the only time this word weighed down is found in the New Testament. Something interesting to note that in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, we find this word used in regard to Pharaoh's heart. In the book of Exodus, the Bible tells us that Pharaoh hardened his heart as he is, was watching the judgment of God take place around him. His heart was obstinate against and desensitized to the working of God, even in his own life. Furthermore, what is interesting about this word to be weighed down is that the word is in the passive tense, meaning that you don't do it, it happens to you. That if you're not taking a diligent heed to your heart, your heart will just eventually be dulled. You will become desensitized. You will become um, cold towards the things of the Lord. You never want to fall in, in, in the place of be, being a backslidden Christian. That's a miserable place to be. You don't want your heart to be consumed with this world and weighed down uh, by this world. This can happen to your spiritual health without you being aware of it if you're not constantly taking heed to yourself. And look, don't, don't uh, look at this exhortation from the Lord as something burdensome to do. Because as you begin to take heed to yourself you begin to experience the power of God at your work in your life. You begin to see the Lord working in you and through you. But the alternative is if you're, if you're living a lukewarm Christian experience, your heart, you may not know it right now, but your heart is currently in the process of being dulled to the things of the Spirit and dulled to the things of God. And that's not God's desire for you. Notice the three things that the Lord says weighs our hearts down in this verse. First, he says, take heed to yourself, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing. You look at the word, and you're just like, what, is, what does that even mean, Lord? <laughs> yeah, I looked in the King James. The, you might have a King James translation in front of you. It says surfeiting, even more confusing. But if you dive deeper into the word carousing, it means dissipation. It's a word that means to be indulgent or to be excessively indulgent in pleasure. And man, that is the world today, isn't it? To be excessively indulgent in the things of this world. Peter tells us that the world says, as it pertains to the last days, the world is always saying that all things continue as they were from the beginning. And the Christian, if we're not careful, we can get to that place as well. Our hearts can be weighed down with indulgence, um, an excessive indulgent in pleasure. That's a dangerous place to be in. Take heed to yourself. So let your hearts be weighed down with carousing. Second, he says, and drunkenness. Drunkenness weighs the heart of the Christian down. And in light of the context, which this warning is coming, whether or not a Christian should or how much a Christian can drink should not be a debate. I'm amazed at some of the petty debates that Christians have sometimes. In light of what Jesus is saying, in, re in, in light of the reality that he says he is coming quickly, and when he comes to take the church out of the way, if you miss it, you will be a recipient of his wrath. I don't think whether or how much a Christian should, should drink should be the topic of debate. I don't think we should try to get as close to the edge as we can. I think we should try to stray away from it as far as possible. Now, I come from a family of a, of a long line of alcoholics. And nothing good has ever resulted from alcohol. I, I challenge you. Uh, look at your own family. Look at your own loved ones. And, and the Bible warns against it. The Bible tells us in, in uh, the book of Proverbs 20 that uh, wine is a mocker and strong drink is a brawler and whoever is led astray by it is a fool. Proverbs 31 says it's not for kings. It's not for kings to drink wine nor for princes intoxicating drink. And the Bible tells you and I in the book of Peter that we are priests and kings unto the Lord. We shouldn't be 
drunk with wine, we should be filled with the Holy Spirit, as Ephesians tells us. He says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, he says, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not be drunk with wine, but be continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. That should be the passion of the Christian's life, is living a spirit-led and a spirit-governed and a spirit-filled life, right? Because the Bible tells us to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And somehow you see it happen in the life of a Christian as they walk with the Lord for some time, their senses, their spiritual life begins to become dulled and desensitized and they begin it's not the big sins it's the little sins as Solomon says that it's the it's the little foxes that nip at the vine that spoil the vineyard and we won't see these things naturally if we're not taking heed to ourselves continually so the first thing that uh, threatens to weigh your heart down and dull your spiritual senses is this excessive indulgence and worldliness Second is drunkenness. And third, look at the text, he says, and the cares of this life. Man, that's a, that's a challenging one. Because we have cares in this life, amen? <laughs> Anyone ever been anxious about something in your life? And rightfully so, I always find it an amazing thing. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. That's a, that's a wild commandment, especially when there's so many things in the world that we're living in right now to actually be worried about. The Bible doesn't say that we're not to have cares about this life. The Bible says that we are not to allow the cares of this life to overtake us. What is the Christian to do with the cares of this life, right? The Bible tells us in 1 Peter 5 to Cast your care upon him because he cares for you. This diligent and continual casting your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. Don't allow the cares of this life to distract you or to consume you because if you and I do, our hearts will be weighed down. The Bible tells us uh, to be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, to let our requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. But I think the further application is this. It's not just the, the, the cares of this life that weigh our hearts down and discourage us. It's the cares and the love of this world that threatens to hinder us. That's why John tells us in 1 John chapter 2, he tells us to do not love the world or the things in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of the life, it's not of the Father, it's of the world. We should have a, um, a holy hatred for worldliness. Paul says in the book of Galatians that the world has been crucified to him and he to the world. The cares of this life choke out the effectiveness of the word of God in your life and mine. And Jesus says in the, in the parable of the sower and the seed, he says in Mark 4, 18 through 19, he says, Now these are the ones that are sown among the thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this life. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires, notice, the desire for other things entering in and choke the word out and it becomes unfruitful. In other words, if you have competing affections in your life, it's going to choke out the effectiveness of the word of God from bearing fruit in your life and mine. We got to guard ourselves against the cares of this life that seek to dull our spiritual senses. This word in your Bible, note it when it says the cares of this life, the word cares suggests being pulled in opposite directions. Uh, 
to be drawn in, in different directions internally. Furthermore, it means to be driven to distraction. And we are living in the most distracted generation in the history of the world. I saw an interesting study today. A recent study revealed that the, in the United States, average screen time per day is seven hours and three minutes. Nearly half, 41% of American teenagers 13 through 18 have a screen time of more than eight hours per day. And what we're not thinking about when we're consumed with the world or the cares of this life or screen the screens in front of us, we are not sensitive to what God might be saying to us. We're distracted. We're divided. We're being pulled in two different directions. And look, we are the first generation that has had to navigate through this challenge. Unfortunately, we live in a world today that is not able to be divorced from our devices. But as the Christian, we need to be Leery of and taking heed to ourselves, lest our hearts be weighed down by carousing drunkenness and the cares of this life. The, the devil's greatest tool, one of his greatest devices, is distraction. Because he seeks to distract you from the presence of God and the purpose of God in your life. You should know this, that you were created for a very specific purpose, that God has called and ordained you for. Mothers here tonight, God has called you to be your children's mother, no one else. No one else can fill that role. God has anointed you to, to, to nurture them, to sow truth into them. It's been said, right, the, the, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. You don't know if you're raising the next evangelist, the next prophet, the next, you don't know who you're raising. And it's hard and it's challenging in the fast-paced society we're living in today, but as parents, as grandparents, you can trust the power of the Holy Spirit in your life to give you wisdom and discernment to parent your child. Sometimes we think that the Spirit just empowers us to, to be a witness. I need so much power of the Holy Spirit to do dishes in my life. <laughs> I see them and my wife's taking care of the kids and the Lord's like, do them. God, I don't want it, Lord. So I have to pray, Lord, fill me. Enable me. Because I don't want to do it begrudgingly. I'm just being honest up here before you. Sometimes it takes me... I, no tangents. The point is this. The point is the enemy seeks to divide and distract us from what God wants to do in and through our lives. He seeks to uh, divide us from the presence of God and the purpose of God in our lives. And when we are not enjoying him and when we're not serving him, we make no spiritual progress in our life and we end up having no eternal impact. I remember hearing um, Alan Redpath, he was a, an old preacher, used to say that the words of a friend of his changed his life. He said, Alan, you know that you can have a saved soul and a wasted life. And he said that truth began to ring in his heart day in and day out. Saved soul, wasted life. Saved soul, wasted life. And as I heard that story, he said, Lord, far be it for me that I have a saved soul and a wasted life. I want to be used in these days to impact the world, to minister to the church, to raise people up, raise people up to be sent out into this world, to preach the, the gospel, to be lights in the midst of darkness. We act as if the, the, the power of the enemy and the power of this world is equal to the power of God. It is not. We are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, the same power that rose Jesus from the grave is alive and is living in us today. We need to walk in the power of it. We need to be filled with his spirit, not distracted by the things of this world. So the Lord in verse 34, he gives us this warning to constantly take heed to ourselves, lest our hearts be uh, weighed down with carousing drunkenness and the cares of this life. 
And he goes on to say, look at the end of verse 34 into verse 35 as we consider our second point. Jesus is going to tell us why he gives us this warning. He says, and that day come on you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Considering the eminency of the rapture of the church, the judgment that will follow, and the second coming of Christ, Jesus emphasizes the importance of spiritual readiness. Notice the certainty in which Jesus spoke. Look at the text. In verse 35, he says, For it will come. This is not a maybe, this is not an if, this is a promise. It will come. But notice the nature in which the day comes. Notice what it says. It says, for it will come as a snare. I love J.B. Phillips' translation of the New Testament on this verse. He says, be on guard. See to it that your minds are never clouded by dissipation or drunkenness or the worries of this life. Or else that day may catch you like a springing trap. I don't know if you have ever tried to set a, one of those really old school mouse traps <laughs> and it goes off and you pull your hand out of the, out of the way before it catches you. Uh, that's the image that's being put before us tonight. It will come like that and then it'll be too late. It'll come as a snare, as a trap. But notice who will be affected by it. Look at the end of the verse. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of this earth. No one is excluded except those who are ready to be gone at the rapture of the church. Why do you and I have nothing to be afraid of in light of what we see? Concerned, absolutely. Diligent, certainly. But fearful, Never. Because we're called to be courageous. You were called to serve the Lord in days like these. Um, the power of the Spirit of God rests upon you and is in you and will fill you and empower you. The, we have access to the resources of God. Everything looks confusing, but the Lord tells us that we have discernment. Everything looks challenging in the days ahead of us, but the Lord tells us that we've been given the spirit of wisdom. God is already one, two, three, four, five steps ahead of the enemy, and so will you be if you stay close to the heart of God. But the Christian must live expectantly. Titus tells us, in, or Paul tells Titus in Titus 2, verse 11 through 13, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's who we are to be looking for. Things unfold around us. We're not looking for a Savior in this world. We have been told that it's going to go this way. We are looking for the blessed hope. We have hope in this world that we're living in. So in verse 34, we saw Jesus issue this warning to constantly be taking heed to ourselves. In verse 35, Jesus told us why he was warning us, because the day, that day is going to come unexpectedly, like a trap, like a snare. It's going to come upon all those who dwell on the face of the earth. Now in verse 36, Jesus is going to tell us how we should respond in light of this warning. Okay, the Lord has warned us. How should we respond to his warning? Notice what he says in verse 36. He says, watch therefore and pray always. As Christians, we must live watchful lives. Um, the term could literally mean to, to, many of you know I played college football. I was a linebacker and the exhortation always from the coach was to keep your head on a swivel. In other words, when you're looking that way, someone's coming after you on this side. To be looking in every direction. The Bible tells us to, to walk circumspectly. That, that word literally means like you're walking on a tightrope or walking through a minefield. To walk carefully, to walk watchfully. We're exhorted by Paul in 2 Timothy 4 to be watchful in all things. The word watch literally means to be vigilant. 
to be attentive and to be ready. And we're to do this in the context of prayer. The watchful Christian is only watchful as much as he or she is prayerful. That's why the enemy does everything he can to discourage and hinder your prayer life. He wants to cause you to be an unbelieving Christian in the power of prayer. But the more that we see in this world and the closer we get to the heart of of Jesus, the more we should be praying. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. Um, We should be confident of the power of prayer in our life. And the enemy does everything to, to wrestle that weapon out of our hands. If you've ever seen um, a fist fight and then someone pulls out a weapon, what's the focus of the fight? It's in obtaining control of the weapon, right? That's why the enemy is always trying to obtain control of prayer in your life. He wants to sow seeds of unbelief in your life. He wants you to stop being expected in prayer. He just wants you to stop believing in the power of prayer because when you're not believing in the power of prayer, you're not believing in the power of God. So he tells us to watch and pray always. The greatest thing that you can do to prepare for the days ahead. Is it buying gold? <laughs> is it getting enough food? Is it, what, what is it? For the Christian, it's being prayerful. It's being prayerful and being led by the Spirit day in and day out. That's why Jesus says in Luke 18, 1, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. We can't forget who is being spoken to in this text. Jesus is speaking to the disciples, and amongst the disciples are Peter, James, and John. This was the first of two times that Peter, James, and John heard these words to watch and to pray. The second time is going to be in a few uh, short verses in the next chapter, in the next scene, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember what the Lord does? He brings Peter, James, and John, this inner circle, deeper into the garden with him. And he tells them to watch and to pray. And he goes and he finds them sleeping And said to Peter specifically, what, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but what? The flesh is weak. Peter's going to hear this a second time. Sometimes we feel that prayer prepares us for the work. Why was the Lord telling Peter to pray now? Why was the Lord telling Peter to pray in the garden? Because there was going to be a moment when it was too late. Remember, he rises from sleep the third time, and the Lord says, rise, my betrayers at hand. And what does Peter do? How does he respond? He responds to a spiritual battle in the flesh. And he pulls out his sword, and he cuts off Malchus's ear. He trusts and the weapons of the flesh more than the weapons of the spirit because he simply wasn't praying, so he was not prepared. Oswald Chambers said that prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. Peter had an opportunity in the Garden of Gethsemane to secure the victory in prayer before the temptation came. That's why you and I must be so diligent to be prayerful before our day even begins. Because you step out that door, a world that is given over to the power of Satan awaits us. And we can either be a light in it or be consumed by it. In every chapter of the book of Acts, one thing that's always been amazing to me is that Peter learned the lesson through his failure, right? We would go on to see Peter, that he would deny the Lord. But in every chapter of the book of Acts that Peter has mentioned, what God does through him and for him is in the context of prayer. At Acts chapter 3, what is he doing? He's going to the gate called Beautiful at the hour of prayer. Acts chapter 4, he prays for boldness. Acts chapter 5, because he's living a prayerful life, he is able to discern the lies of Ananias and Sapphira. Acts chapter 6, they're praying about who, would, uh, who they would add to the team to serve alongside of them. 
Acts chapter 10, he's praying uh, on the rooftop before Cornelius comes. Acts chapter 12, he's being prayed for in prison. What marked the life of Peter after this point was his prayerfulness and his dependence upon prayer. Peter didn't just learn the lesson, Peter taught the lesson. He learned the importance of watchfulness and prayerfulness through the power of his own failure. He says in 1 Peter 4, verse 7, he says, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Like I said, the word watch is the word to be vigilant. And uh, Peter will say in 1 Peter 5, 8, he says to be sober, to be vigilant, because the adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So in critical days, we are called to watch and pray. But notice what we are called to pray for at the end of verse 36. He says, watch and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Remember, Jesus is saying this to the men who will become uh, the apostles. And he breaks everyone down into two classes of people. Those who have a sure standing before God and those who don't. There's only two. And if you've given your life to Christ today, you can be assured that you have a sure standing before the Lord. You are standing robed in the righteousness of Christ. Where there is no condemning power, you are sanctified, you are justified. He tells us two things to pray for. Notice that we would be counted worthy to escape the judgment of God and that we would be counted worthy to stand before the Son of Man. So you have to ask ourselves, is there anything that you and I can do to be worthy? Only the blood of the Lamb and the atoning work of Christ on the cross will ever make us worthy. Pray that you will be worthy. Pray that your mind would be full of the cross of Jesus Christ and the power of the gospel in your life as you walk with Jesus daily and you're experiencing a life-giving power that is flowing through you. As he says in John chapter 15, abide in me and I in you, for apart from me you can do what? Nothing. Amen. Pray that you'd be counted worthy. Pray that you would have a trust in the sufficiency and the finished work of the cross. So Peter exhorts us in 2 Peter 1 and verse 10, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. So how should we then live in these days that we are walking through right now? And no matter what takes place in the days ahead of us, we should take the warning of Jesus to take heed to ourselves seriously. And we have learned that this is a constant and continual act because we are in danger of having our hearts be weighed down. Again, we don't do it. It happens to us through overindulgence, the cares of this life, the, re the, the, the truth of the effects of drunkenness. We should live lives of, of great expectancy as Christians. We should not be looking for his judgment. We should be looking for his return because we won't be here for that. We should respond to this warning and the reality of the eminency of his return by being watchful and prayerful because he promises that that day will come to pass. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. It is a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. Lord, without it, we have no bearing in this world that we live in. And so now, Father, we would ask that you would just bless this evening, Lord, as we worship you.
Lord, we would ask that you would not allow the cares of this world or the enemy to snatch away the effectiveness of your word in our lives tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.